Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Ron McDonald to the show. Mr. McDonald has over 35 years of both public and private sector experience, ranging from international roles within the Parliament of Canada to serving on the boards of numerous publicly listed resource companies. From 1988 to 1997, he was the Member of Parliament for Halifax, Nova Scotia, during which time he was appointed by the Prime Minister of Canada as Parliamentary Secretary of International Trade. From 1997 to 2002, Mr. Macdonald was President and CEO of the Council of Forest Industries, a large lumber manufacturing, grading and marketing group where he developed new markets in China, Korea, India, and Japan. Ron, how are you doing today? Uh, Never better, Raj. Honestly, it's a great day. Ron, you know, we spoke briefly offline, and just the energy and your positivity just resonates through the headphones here. Tell me what made it such a great day. Well, I'm alive, number one. Uh, Surviving (laughs) COVID, number two. I've got the best and brightest uh, team I've ever had. Uh, and like a third of them come in every day because we're socially distant. And uh, yeah, I mean, th- it's good. Life is good. We got to find today's a good day. Today's a good day. Uh, uh, why is it a good day today? I'm on with you, Raj, number one. I've never done a podcast before, so it's a first, and I like doing first. But I guess generally it is that uh, we've got a great technology here, and people are now recognizing it. And all these guys that, 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 uh, and gals that work in my, uh, in my shop here that have worked so hard, they're now seeing that all that hard work is going to pay off and they're going to do something spectacular that has real meaning uh, for how we use energy and how we clean our air and things like that. So that's why I feel good today. Feel well, I appreciate it. And I'm sure if we ever met in person, we'd be fast friends because I feel the same way. Yeah. But before I get to your energy, tell me, where are you currently located? Well, I'm currently located in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, it's a great city. I've been living here for almost 20 years. I also have a place in Toronto, and that's another great city. And I usually work between the two cities, but uh, once I took this endeavor over about a year ago, it was pretty clear that in order to get this company where it needed to get, I had to give 100%. And I had to you know, find ways to encourage everybody around me to give that 110%. So I spend most of my days and evenings here, but we have an office in Toronto, and we also have a new office down in Brooklyn, which I've never seen because we got the office, and then COVID hit, and the borders <laughs> have been closed. So at some point, somebody down there will send me a picture of it, and I'll visualize it in my head for the first time whenever that is that I get to cross the border again. So you mentioned two of my favorite city cities. Toronto has been my number one city for about 40 years now. I have family in Toronto and try to get up there as often as possible. I've driven there several times from Dallas and took my kids there a couple of years ago for the first time. So Toronto has been number one on my list for a long time. Well, Toronto is a great city. Toronto is is so vibrant. Uh, there's so much going on. The energy, uh, the people energy and, and sort of that collective buzz that happens. Uh, for me, that is, uh, it's like electric. It's like electricity, actually, for me. And Vancouver gives you something different. Vancouver is spectacularly gorgeous, and it's a calmer, it's more zen out here. And so the mix for the, the mix of the two of them for me is, is just my ideal environment. I would agree about Vancouver. My wife and I did a trip there soon after we were married, so about 14 years ago, and we drove up to Capilano. We spent a few days in Vancouver. We came back down to Seattle, so, and we did the Orca Islands, too. So I enjoyed the entire trip, but you're right. Between Toronto and Vancouver, I think you're spoiled for choice. Yeah, yeah, I think I have. I think I have. (laughs) So, Ron, I'd like to open the show by asking my guest the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Well, I'm the son of a Cape Breton coal miner, um, and we grew up poor. But poor is a relative thing, right? 
So if you got a lot of rich people around you and you don't have what they've got, then you think you're poor. If you got a lot of poor people around you, then you don't think you're poor. So I never knew I was poor <laughs> until I got off Cape Breton Island, uh, went to university. and uh, But you know what? It, it's, it's kind of a relative thing, right? I, when I say that I grew up poor, I grew up in the best community I could possibly grow up in. There was a collective sense that everybody looked after everybody in that community. And it was because it was a coal mining community. It was a it was a community that was marred with tragedy when you know these coal mines would go out five six miles under the Atlantic Ocean, and there'd be stone falls and there'd be explosions. So in the run of a year, you know, there'd be a number of kids in my school who would lose a dad, and so there was this kind of collective we have to look after each other, and I think that uh, that's made me who I am. Uh, that's made me who I am. And I remember one time that uh, we, it was a convent school that we went to. And I think it was in grade three. And even though, you know, when we were poor, we weren't dirty. We had clothes that were clean and we were fed. But there were some people that were really poor, even in that poor community. And I remember one of them, uh, family uh, was Mackenzie's. Um, and they were dirt poor. And the first snow, uh, and the girl came. And she was wearing what we call jellies back then, right? The, the plastic uh, sandals. Mm-hmm. And there was snow coming down. And she had, uh, she had a sweater without buttons on it. And the kids made fun of her. And I come home and I told my mom. And my mom, she just stiffened up. And she said, Did you, were you one of the people that were making fun of her? And I said, no. And she said, you get over here. And she, I said, no, mom, I didn't. And she tapped me in the back of the head, which she was prone to do. And she said, uh, did you intervene? And I said, no. And she said, why not? And I said, I don't know. And she said, I'm going to tell you something right now. She said, there's nobody any better than you in this community, and you're no better than anybody else. And you're responsible for yourself, but you're also responsible for people that need your help. That has been a fundamental thing that has driven me my entire life. And uh, I get teared up sometimes when I think about that because I, my mom is gone now. Uh, but a lesson learned in humility. And uh, it's followed me all my life. And it, it, it is what has given me a good life and an out, outlook that's allowed me to, to go to places that probably shouldn't go, but uh, have been lucky enough to. You know, there are a few things I want to tease out from that. Thank you for sharing that personal story. First, you mentioned about being poor. And I'm not going to say that people don't suffer hardship. People do. But I think sometimes, you know, poverty can be, also be a mindset. And I think that, you know, what your parents and what the community instilled with you that is that just because you might not have resources, you don't have to have a poor mindset. And the other part of that, you know, you mentioned regarding your mother asking you if you did anything about it. And I think all too often when we are ambivalent, we think that we are perhaps don't have to engage. But I think there's a difference between being ambivalent and taking a stand against things. Yeah. And I think, you know, right now, as we're going through these difficult times, whether it's around you know, Black Lives Matters or the COVID and other things that are going on politically, I think we need to sometimes realize that there are times to take stands and maybe now is the time. Well, you know what? It's, um, and poverty is a relative thing. And uh, poverty isn't just money. It's other things as well. Um, but, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Cape Breton Island, a tough place to grow up, I got to tell you. Different coal mining communities, you know, there was different gangs by different parts of the town, which would be named after like number 12 colliery, number 16 colliery. Um, and I wanted to leave. I, I just, I just, you know, I wanted to see when I was a kid, eh, this is kind of funny because our community was right on the Atlantic ocean, the North Atlantic. And, uh, I used to lay down at night with my little transistor and I would get seeing, I would get, uh, uh, Larry King, uh, and it would just be scratching, be coming in and out from New York city. And I would lay there at night when I would get that, you know, get the signal and it wouldn't stay. And I would sort of dream about going to New York city. Um, and then I would go sometimes in the summer and I'd lay up, you know, the 40 foot cliffs down to the ocean. I'd lay in the field and I would, cause I, I knew when these things were come and I would wait for the transatlantic flights going from Europe to New York because they would stop in Gander and then they'd fly right over my hometown way up. And I used to sit there and I used to think about stuff. I used to think about what it must be like to fly in an airplane. I used to think about what it was like uh, to go to New York City. I'd think about things like, well, what, what does Europe look like? And by the time I was 10, I had read, 
we had a, a thing called the Books of Knowledge. <laughs> this guy was really nerdy, I, apparently. And the Books of Knowledge, uh, you know, a, 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 a bookseller went and you could buy it on credit. And so my mom bought it. And by the time I was probably 10, I had read every one of those at least twice. So what I've learned, what I, what I knew then is that I had an insatiable thirst for just knowledge, right? Just knowledge. And uh, yeah, so, so growing up in Cape Breton was wonderful for me. Uh, leaving there gave me an opportunity to really sort of realize my dreams and to see what I could do. And uh, yeah, so that was the beginning of my life at, at 26. I was the chief of staff to the deputy prime minister of Canada. At 27, I was uh, chief of staff to the leader of the, gov- uh, the, the leader of the government in the Senate. At 31, I got elected to the Canadian Parliament. So, you know what? Uh, my mother said one time, you know, Ron, we're really proud of you, but we think you got a bit of a defect. And I said, what's that, Mom? And she said, you lack that little thing that says, wait, think about this before you do it. You think you can do anything. And I remember that well. And I probably do, and I probably still think that. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but uh, it is who I am. Well, that's fantastic, and I think it's a great segue because I'm excited to you know, make a right turn here and move into Zinc 8 Energy. Can you give us an overview of Zinc 8 Energy? Sure. Well, these are really difficult times, but they're exciting times. Uh, there is a collective global uh, demand, not a will, but a demand that we've got to look after this earth <laughs> that, we're, that, we're, that we inhabit, that we've got to make the right choices, not just for us, but for future generations, or there won't be future generations. So renewable energy, uh, sustainable forestry, repra- all of these things have been happening over the years. Renewable energy, I've been around this for, for quite a while. And you knew that, you know that, you know, th- these technologies are there, but they kind of weren't really economic. And they were tilting, pardon the pun, at big windmills, you know, with the coal fire uh, generators and, and uh, you know, oil gas, uh, gas uh, peaking plants. And renewables have been around for quite a while. And everybody says, oh, no, no, but they don't work. They don't make money. They don't make any of that stuff because of self-interest. Well, they do work. And they're getting to a point that they are economic. And I think coming out of COVID, and I'm getting to your question, but coming out of COVID, I just sense uh, by everybody I talk to is they know that they can change their future. They can have clean air. They can have clean water. They can do things differently. They could, they can and must be sustainable. So Zinc 8 is a, is a novel. It's a very unique approach to energy storage. So everybody knows energy storage. They think of Tesla and you know electric vehicles and that. And that's right. That's lithium ion batteries. And they're, they're absolutely great. They've, they've started to change the world. But when you get into larger applications, you know, where you're looking at decarbonizing the buildings in New York City, or if you're looking at uh, the massive, fast pace of electrification, you're get, you know what? Some countries like Britain are going to get away, get a, a, a they're going to ban uh, the internal combustion engine they have by 2040. Might go down to 2035. States in the United States are going the same way. So electrification is happening and it's happening from renewables. But in order to make that happen, you've got to have some system of long duration economic storage. Lithium ion batteries, about four hours. The battery here that we've developed over 12 years at Think 8 Energy Solutions uh, is one that uh, it it, it provides the most economic long duration storage that we can see anywhere in the world, other than like Pumped Hydro, which is a dam, or, you know, Case, which is uh, a compressed air and underground, unused. uh, or abandoned, uh, say, salt mines. So what these guys have done in Gaza, the company that I was lucky enough to take over last year, is over these years, they have developed a very unique way to enable the greening of our, of our economy through renewable energy. So we, are, we have developed a benign technology. It doesn't burn uh, like some other batteries, which can explode. Uh, it is non-toxic. We can put it in the school, in a building, anywhere. Uh, it's a 20-year battery, and it's got the lowest cost, of any battery on the market today. And so I've been blessed to come in here. And my job when I came in was to help the help the, the, the company commercialize, to take this message to the world in a way that the world is, you know, my, my end users that uh, that were credible. But we're, we're, I'm so happy. We're going to play a major role in the advancement of green energy uh, globally. And, and I know some people would say, well, that, that's a stretch. That's not a stretch. And that's where we're heading. That's what that's what our target is. 
And if we don't get absolutely there, we're going to get further ahead than, than if we didn't have that target. So Zinc 8 Energy Solution, it, uh, we're producing a new type of energy storage. It's applicable globally. Uh, our first launches are going to be in New York, New York State. New York, we love New York. And uh, our first manufacturing and fabrication plant is going to be in New York State. We're going to be creating sustainable green jobs. And we're going to be providing a technology to the world that will allow for the rapid uh, integration into grids of renewable energy. So that's kind of the story. That's where we're at. We've only been public, although we've been around for we've only been public as a public company for a year. So a lot has happened in the last year, and uh, and a lot more is going to happen in the next two. So that's what my company does. So we know that storage is the third leg of the stool. We have generation, storage, and distribution. Yeah. Storage is going to be very important going forward. Without getting, obviously, or without giving away any trade secrets, can you get perhaps a little technical and share how it works? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so the how it works is it's a component system. And uh, this has been developed over about 12 years. It goes way back to, to a company in California maybe 17 years ago. Uh, but it, it, it's a component system. It's, it's, uh, it's very simple when you look at it, but it's taken us $72 million to get this simple. <laughs> so it's got three components. It's got a zinc regenerator. And so what we do is that uh, in that zinc regenerator, we take zinc uh, and we, we, we generate zinc particles in the zinc regenerator and we release some oxygen into the atmosphere, very pure oxygen, so it's positive. And then the zinc particles go over to a storage tank, it's just a plastic tank, and it's maintained in a, in a KOH electrolyte, which is potassium hydroxide, which is basically potash, um, a, a, a fertilizer. When you require it, we then... When the power is needed, we pump it to the third unit, and the zinc particles are delivered to the power stack, and they grab some oxygen that they had given up in the first one, and uh, we generate power. So we can hold power for long periods of time. It's a 20-year battery, uh, and it's extremely economic. It's got no, you know, it doesn't have these exotic metals or minerals like rare earths or, you know, cobalt and stuff. Zinc is everywhere. It's very plentiful. So, and we don't use the zinc. This is amazing. So we don't use the zinc. It doesn't get consumed. We use it over and over and over again for the 20-year uh, twenty year life cycle of the battery. So this is very unique. Uh, it's taken a lot of smart people, a lot of trial and error to get to this point. We've got 20 patents on this. We've got four U.S. patents pending, and we've got three patents being written. And we're going to be delivering our batteries. Our first battery is getting delivered in four weeks uh, in uh, Vancouver here to support a net zero a uh, 358 foot long building. Uh, it's a residence. Um, yeah, so so that's generally it. I mean, it's a three component. There's a lot of technology around it, but it's a system that can be easily built anywhere in the world because it's component. We can size it up or we can size it down. So that's generally how it works. And for those of you listening, there's a beautiful visual of it on the website. I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes. So Ron, how many hours of storage can a battery hold? Well, it's. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. I mean, if anybody's looking, if they get to the to the website and look at uh, our our lo our name, Zinc Eight, it means something. Um, the eight in our in our Zinc Eight, it's a number eight. It almost looks like if you put it on the side, it's the symbol for infinity. Uh, and and there's a bunch of other reasons why Zinc Eight works, but but this literally, I mean, I get there's limits to everything, uh, but we can do eight hours, ten hours. 30 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours of storage. We can do multi-day. We, we can do multiple week storage if it's required. And uh, the, the more storage that you build out, the cheaper per unit of storage gets. So let's say at eight hours of storage, it's about, say, $250 per kilowatt hour installed. And then when you go further down, say, 20, uh, 40 hours, I'd say 40 hours of storage, uh, 30 hours, it's about $100 a kilowatt hour. 40 hours goes down to 86, 100 hours it goes down to $62. So this system is built uh, for, large, for large applications. So the infinity symbol uh, kind of tells us that uh, that's where we're going because we think in the future, in order to have full electrification from renewables, you're going to have to have uh, multi-week systems in some places. And our system and some other technologies that are developing are going to be able to provide that. So we can actually make that switch from GHG uh, producing emissions to absolutely renewable sources of power. 
it's funny you say that about the figure eight. I have an eight-year-old daughter, and I've told her that eight, I think, is a fantastic age. It's the best age because of that symbol goes to infinity. And when you're nine, you're closer to double digits. So I appreciate that comment regarding the eight. Yeah, <laughs> yes, of course. Specifically about your unit, is it scalable? Like, do we need multiple or does one unit or a bigger unit in well, order to hold more energy? Yeah, well, okay, so it depends on what you want. And this is what's really good. So on other battery systems, it, you know, your amount of uh, power and the amount of storage has got to be one-to-one, right? Like lithium-ion battery, uh, the, this, the power is stored in an electrolyte in the power stack. We don't store it in the power stack. We store it in a separate tank. So if you want twice as much power, we just double the size of your stack. If you want double the amount of storage, we don't have to double the stack. We just double the storage tank. And uh, we generate more zinc to sit in that storage tank. And there's some other technologies that are out there, right? Uh, hydrogen and some others where you got to generate the hydrogen offsite, then you take it and you use it in your in your battery system, right? In your fuel cell. Uh, we don't have to do that. We produce the fuel right in the unit. So, you know, if this is uh, in a, at an industrial site, if it's to provide backup power for a hospital or, uh, you know, or a university campus, um, they tell us what they want, and we give them what they want. We don't give them the other stuff that adds to the cost. We just build a system to what their needs are because it's component. Uh, yeah, so so we can go, if you want to double your power, uh, it, as I said, the stack. But this is what's so economic. The cheapest part of our system is the storage tank, and that's what keeps our cost down. So, yeah, we can go up if somebody wants one megawatt of power and they want uh, 40 hours. We can build that system for them. Not going to be a problem. And if they did 50, if they wanted 60, it's going to get cheaper. Every kilowatt of power that you store, of storage uh, capacity that you want, the overall system cost gets cheaper. And is there any ongoing maintenance required? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, with anything, there's maintenance, but the maintenance is very low. Um, so if I look at maintenance, we, we say it's a 20-year battery, 20,000 cycles, and uh, – the only real thing that we have to change over that life cycle is at about eight years, depending on depending on the use rate, depending on what they're doing with the battery, at about eight years, we have to replace the cathodes. And the cathodes are one of the least expensive parts of the system. So when we sit down and we say, this is the cost of the battery, and this is the lifetime cost of your energy storage system, it includes any upgrades, it includes the maintenance, and it includes any parts like the cathodes that would be replaced at probably every eight years. So our cost, when we give the cost, it's all in. So you're not getting this and then saying, oh, there's, oh, there's, then I got to replace all these things. That's all part of the cost of the system. Sounds like an attractive opportunity. Now, can you share a bit about the business model? Are you direct to consumer? Are you no. B2B? What's the, what's the business yeah. model? Well, it's kind of interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, there's enough challenges in trying to take a, a tech company public and to develop a product and then to take the product not just regionally or, glo or, or nationally, but globally. So the strategy that, uh, that we've adopted here is that we will grow through partners, uh, through partnerships and uh, partners that have pipelines of potential projects. So I don't have a single salesperson here. Uh, Mark Baggio, who is my VP and, and he is the uh, responsible for global market development and partnerships, myself and two other people that do other jobs here as well, that's the team. So we are, we've negotiated a couple of deals with uh, uh, one company in India. It's well-known in India. It's uh, uh, Vijay Electricals. They had been the second largest manufacturer of transformers in the world. They operate in a country. They're in every state in India, plus uh, at the federal utility level. They're in 42 countries. They've got a pipeline. <laughs> so we just announced a week ago Monday that we're going to be partnering with them to come up with some way that we can joint venture to to uh, to access that market. Uh, we've got the two projects that we've got in New York uh, State, the one with NIPA, New York Power Authority. They have they have probably hundreds of projects where this type of system uh, will aid in the economics and the robustness of their TND system, transmission and distribution. Uh, the other one that we've got with digital energy out of Rochester uh, for for big project that we're going to be doing. I think we've mentioned it down in uh, New York City. Uh, they've got over 100 projects that they've already built out where this technology can improve the efficiency and the economics. So we're going to grow through pipelines. 
And uh, so it will not be direct to consumer, but hopefully known brands that have exceptional distribution systems will be able to take this to industrial, commercial, residential uh, users uh, globally over the next few years. So let me ask you this then. If there's an adventurous entrepreneur who thinks he or she can get involved and perhaps create a pipeline in the future, would you be willing to work with someone like that? You know what? I've never turned down any opportunity in my life. And so we never say no. We say, let's see if this can work. I love that. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to switch gears here, get to the crux of our conversation, the why behind what you do. Now, earlier in the conversation, you know, you shared how optimistic you are, your outlook on life. You kind of identified some of the pathways you've taken. But why Zinc 8 Energy? Why now? What keeps you motivated? What drives you? Well, I think a couple of things, you know, I think a, a lot of time in life, people get, uh, they get too comfortable. I've never been comfortable in my life. I, I've always been uncomfortable because I, wa- I always wanted to do more. And people become comfortable. They become complacent. Uh, they, bec- they say, okay, I know this. This is my job. And I'm not going to move to another job that may be more stimulating because I'm worried about blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't worry about stuff. I, there are stuff I worry about. But for me... When opportunities are dropped in front of you, even if they're kind of scary and even if they're kind of disruptive, don't be afraid to take them. I wasn't, I didn't even know about this company two years ago. Uh, I was about to retire for the fourth or maybe fifth time in my life. <laughs> and uh, I was quite serious this time. I was, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm going on boards. That's it. And I'm going to semi-retire. And uh, I got a call. I got a call from a friend of mine that wanted to invest in a company called, well, it's it, what became Zinc 8, and I encouraged him not to do it. <laughs> and he <laughs> said, why? And I said, because there's no Zinc Air batteries anywhere close to prime time. Just don't waste your money. And he said, Ron, can you really, I'm going to send you this, right? Could you look at it? And uh, uh, my business partner, he got his engineers to have a look at it and, with no urgency. And they came back and they said, we think there's something here. If they're telling the truth, they made some major breakthroughs. So I, I was in Toronto running a company. I flew up to Vancouver. And I thought about it. And, so, and then they said, Ron, will you go on the board? Uh, let me think about it. Anyway, fast forward a couple of months. I said, I, I drank this Kool-Aid. This is a major technological breakthrough in storage. And I want to be part of it. I want to be part of the success of this. And uh, so anyway, that's kind of how that's kind of how I got into zinc eight energy storage and we came in and uh, it was having trouble so you know some of the financially it was difficult and just focus on the technology focus on the product focus on the market and it's just like I, I'm 65 I feel like I'm 27 again I gotta tell you uh, and it's uh, that's what that's that's how I got here and we're going to take this to commercialization And uh, then we're going to leave it to somebody else to take it to the next level. Well, you sound like you're 25. I'm going to rephrase my question regarding, you know, you're you're working on a product project that's going to do, that has benefits for the environment and the climate itself. What drives you? Why do you think that's important? Because it's important. It's important because I want my, I want my kids. And if I ever get grandkids from my kids, (laughs) uh, I, I want them to understand better that, that, there are better ways to do things. I want clean air. You know, for some of my life, I was involved in different activities where maybe I wasn't so environmentally uh, and responsible, shall I say. And they were the times. But you grow, right? And you grow. And I do want cleaner air. I want things to be different. I want a, a better connection for me personally with my environment. And I want to be able to provide tools for other people to, to be able to have that better interaction and lower f- carbon footprint, lower impact on our environment. And, you know, I'm just, I uh, started off, I'm just, uh, you know, poor boy from Cape Breton. And uh, to be allowed to participate in something like this that can have such an impact is really a blessing. It really is a blessing. And before we move on, I want to highlight and congratulate you on the recent award. I won't share what it is. Can you share what? The recent award that Think Eight won. Yeah. Um, so uh, back on Earth Day, uh, the City of New York, through their Department of Buildings, uh, announced a decarbonation challenge 
for the uh, uh, for New York City, all, all the boroughs, and uh, it was it was supported by it was supported by a number of local laws, which required buildings of over say twenty five thousand square feet, I think it was, uh, to come up with plans to lower their carbon footprint. This is and New York City, New York State are leading globally. I got to tell you, uh, with the uh, with the policies to move towards this new economy, and so they came out with a uh, with a challenge. Uh, my senior product development VP here uh, took the time to send in, you know, what we thought we had that might contribute. And then we kind of forgot about it, to be quite honest, because <laughs> we're kind of busy. And then about two and a half weeks ago, we got a note saying you're in the finals. You've been shortlisted. So then I, you know, virtually did a five or six minute presentation. And then a week ago, Sunday morning, when I was having my coffee and put my uh, computer on, it said, congratulations, you you won the, the New York Department of Buildings Decarbonation Challenge. So we are one of four companies. We're the only one in the storage area. The other ones are incredible technology to help individuals. Um, but they selected us. And so we're still trying to get our heads around what does that mean. But it means at least that they are going to be working to help incorporate our technology into the building code. And uh, it appears that if our technology is used uh, on projects by buildings, uh, to lower the carbon footprint, that uh, uh, they probably will be should be fast tracked on the regulatory side. So this is a big honor, you know. Like there's a lot of companies out there, and like I said, we're a little company, and uh, we've been getting awards over the last year all over the place. But the one for New York City is, you know, it's the Big Apple, man. Come on. And uh, I even broke into a little song, and, and the staff went, "Oh, Ron, please don't do that. You know, <laughs> if we can make it here, we can make it anywhere." You know, if you make it there, you make it anywhere in New York. So New York, it's almost like we fell into this track. It started with NIPA, New York. Everybody started looking at us. Then we got NYSERDA, New York. And then we got the building challenge. We won it, New York. So it's big for us as a company. Uh, we have, you have no idea how many calls we're now getting uh, from builders, from contractors, from EPCs wanting to know how our technology can help them or their clients reach these targets that have been put out by the, in New York City. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a bold statement. Earlier on in our conversation, you mentioned as a young boy laying on the ground, looking up at the plains and thinking about New York City. Yeah. So I would say to some extent, you almost manifested that many years later. Wow. That oh that is that's deep. <laughs> that is deep. I never I never connected the two. Um, yeah, you know, like things happen. You know, and sometimes you just got to let things happen, right? And uh, I started to say earlier, I think, you know, Yogi Bear, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. You know, everybody laughs at that. But when opportunities come to you, don't be afraid to let them happen, right? I have been my career has been all over the place. So, you know, I, when I got out of university, I started a building company, a small company, uh, sold it to my partner. Then I got into politics and I was chief staff to the deputy prime minister. I got elected to parliament at 31, one of the youngest members of parliament. Uh, then I left that at 41. I ran a big Pacific Coast fishery, ran the largest forest uh, group in Canada. I'm not a forester. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a marine biologist and I'm not an engineer. <laughs> and now I'm running this company. So the reason I say that is, you know what, sometimes there is karma and we push it away. And sometimes you just got to let it happen. Sometimes when I would used to do lectures at the university and I tell people, you know, you're young, you get the whole world ahead of you. Don't close it off. OK, don't deny it. Don't be afraid. Take up the challenge. Don't be afraid to do things. I've never been afraid to do things like I said earlier. My, my, my mother said you lack that. You lack that thing that says don't do that. Think about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so so th now we're here in New York. To your point, it's come full circle. You just gave me something I can talk about the next time I give a speech. <laughs> and I feel like you embody that quote about taking a leap and building your wings on the way down. Yeah, I, I can. I want to tell you just a, a quick story. When I was uh, I was responsible for implementing the Candy U.S. softwood lumber deal when I was parliamentary secretary for trade in the Kretchen government. Um, and I thought everybody disliked me over in the forest industry because I had to approve all the quota. Uh, so the story is, 
is I left politics. I didn't have a job. I just figured I had to leave. There was some illness. My, my wife had been ill. And I made a decision that as much as I loved that job and I thought I'd never have a job that I'd love so much, I had to really examine what was important and my kids were important and I quit. Everybody thought, wow, what did he quit for? I wanted to re-engage and raise my kids. Best decision I ever made. I had no job. What happens? The Council of Forest Industries comes and they hire me. And it was like, wow, it tripled my salary uh, almost overnight. The issue I'm, I'm raising about that is somebody from the National Post wanted to come and do a profile on me and they drove out to Stanley Park where all these old growth trees are. And I had this sudden panic attack going in. And I thought, what happens if this reporter asks me what kind of tree that is? Because I had no <laughs> idea, right? I had no idea. And I kind of panicked a bit. The reason I'm saying that is I wasn't a forester, but the skills that you get from the previous job and from your upbringing, they're transferable. And just let things happen. And you grow every time that happens. I grew to be the leading voice probably in Canada, maybe internationally in forestry. Because I had great staff. I didn't have to be the forester. I had the best forester that anybody could have supporting me. I had, you know, I had the best phytosanitary guys supporting me. I didn't have to do that. But uh, so don't be afraid just because that's not like on your path that you thought. Don't be afraid to veer away. You'll be surprised at some of the wonderful things that can happen. I so agree with you. I think um, August Rodin said that uh, nothing is a waste of time if you use the experience wisely. Absolutely. That truer words were never written. So you've taken quite a scenic journey. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you would say you've learned about yourself? Um, don't, I, I always had a bit of a fear of failure, and I never failed until I failed. Right? <laughs> so I never failed until I failed. And failure was new to me, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I called up one of my best friends, uh, Dennis Mills. He was in Parliament with me. They call him Mr. Toronto. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful individual. Um, and I called him and I said, Dennis, I told him my failure. And he said, you want sympathy for me? Because you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And I expected sympathy, to be quite honest, from that friend. And he did not give it. And he said, listen, don't be feeling sorry for yourself. He said, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you get right into the fray again. And I thought that what he told me was terrible. I didn't think it was very, he, it wasn't very thoughtful about my frame of mind. It was the best advice, one of the pe best piece of advice, because I get up the next day, and I brush myself, and I, and you know what? I wore my failure. You have to wear your failures. Otherwise, you don't grow. If you hide them, they stay there, and they stick, and they hold you back. So that's one of the one of the big lessons I've learned in my life. I love that lesson. Hold your failure. Own your failure. So, Ron, it's 2025. What does the future hold for Zinc 8? Uh, Zinc 8, I think, in 2025 will be a global uh, manufacturer of, uh, of, of our storage system. It'll be a better system. We've already started the next iteration for a 250 kilowatt battery. Uh, so this is a good thing about technology and science. You, 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 it, it just continues to get better. It continues to make us better. Uh, so 2025, I would think that uh, we'll be operating in every continent in three years, four years from now. Well, longer, three, four, five years, 2025. Yeah, I think that this will be a company that uh, will be socially conscious, that will be delivering a better and better product, that will allow for full integration all over the world, of renewable energy uh, and will make le people's lives better. You know, that's, that's, you have to do that. You've, you've got to always make things a bit better. So that's where I see the company. And, you know, hopefully I'll be sitting back and smiling internally that I was allowed to have something to do with that. Well, that's an aggressive goal, but after hearing your story, I wouldn't bet against you. You got to have aggressive goals. If you don't have aggressive goals, listen, when I, when I, when I, way back, I went up to Ottawa. Uh, from Cape Breton, and I, a friend of my dad's was uh, uh, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, and he invited me to lunch. He had served in the war with my dad. He had lost a leg and an arm. And so I went to meet him at the parliamentary restaurant, this hick from Cape Breton, and I got there, and it's, it was, it's magnificent. And I got there, and the maitre d' came over and said, excuse me, sir, where's your tie? I didn't own a tie. You couldn't get in the restaurant without a tie. So 
Dan McDonald, the minister, uh, came over and uh, he said, oh, well, why don't we take your tie? So the major he gave me his tie, didn't match anything, and I sat down. And I said, you know what? I like this place. I want to be here. I'm going to run for parliament. I decided at that table, and that was so brash, like, are you serious? He didn't even have a tie to come in here. And uh, nine years later, I was sitting there as a member of parliament, eating my first meal in the parliamentary restaurant. So <laughs> aim high. Aim high. Oh. So that leads beautifully into my last question. You know, you've given so much advice during this conversation and with your aim high. But if you could share some specific advice or words of wisdom with the audience, it could be professional or personal, what would it be? <sighs> Have quiet humility in your successes. It's not about what everybody else thinks. It's about how you feel about what you've done. And all of the limits that you have, they're in your brain. They're like pieces of flotsam and jetsam, and they're in there. And sometimes they scare you, right, to not do what you really maybe were born to do. Clear the clutter out every so often. Take the time to just reflect about who you are and how wonderful you are and what you've got to contribute, and then go chase it. Clear the clutter from your mind and then go chase it. It's beautiful, Ron. I've so enjoyed speaking with you, Ron. Is there anything that we have not explored or something you'd like to share before we go? No, look, this has been wonderful. It's my first podcast, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to experience this. Ron, I am super excited for your company. For those of you out there, please go to the website, zinc8energy.com. Remember, don't bet against Ron. And Ron, hopefully I'll catch up with you again soon. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Before we go, I'm excited to share that we've launched our comic strip, The Adventures of Mira and Nexi. You can find the first issue at our website, nexuspmg.com, under the Original Content tab. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.